I think I might read three in Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is preaching the Sermon on the Mount, verses 21 through 23. Jesus said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name the many wonderful works. Then, I, then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now if you're willing, turn to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. Verse 16, Jesus is speaking, and he says, So the last shall be first, and the first last. For many be called, but few chosen. Now that statement is, is so important that if you're willing to turn about two pages in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 22 and look at verse 14, Jesus once again Matthew twenty two fourteen, Jesus says, For many are called, but few are chosen. Oh, that's, that's, that's sounding tough if you're willing. On over in your Bibles to a, a Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. And, and uh, I must confess to you, even before I read this last Sunday evening, and I, I brought a message and I talked about fearing the Lord and how the Word of God teaches that clearly and went from Abraham and how he feared God all the way through many. And I did just quickly name numerous examples of men and women in the Word of God that feared God. Well, here in Math, or Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Let's pray. Lord, it's your word. I pray that you're already blessing your word and that folks inside this room have done like has happened on many occasions. It's not what the preacher says. It's what you say, Lord. And just by the reading of your precious, wonderful word, our hearts can be pricked, our souls stirred, and may we serve you and do that which you want us to do. For it's in Jesus' sweet name I pray. Amen. Last Sunday evening we delivered a message, or tried to, on fearing the Lord. And uh, we pointed out, that, as we mentioned, the numerous passages of Scripture, uh, seriously, pointedly, where the Word of God teaches us that the people feared God, and they were supposed to fear God. But I've got to be honest with you, I like to listen to other preachers that I respect. I must confess I don't respect all preachers. I'm sorry. Uh, but this week I was listening to, flip, well, I was, first of all, I was flipping channels, watching different preachers, different preachers, different song, whatever, uh, Christian channels, and uh, came across a preacher, and I just stopped. And, um, boy, he was breaking me up and down the coals. He said, fear not, fear not, fear not. And I just, you know, I just delivered what I thought was a pretty good sermon on fear. Well, he I, I, I must confess, I did not know him, didn't recognize him, and to be honest with you, he looked like he was about as much a redneck as me, so I kind of flipped the channel. <laughs> he was preaching against what I preached last Sunday night. Fear not, fear not. Well, I flipped the channel, I go to David Jeremiah. He's fixing to start a sermon. Fear not! I said, hold on, Lord, time out. <laughs> I am serious. He, he jumped on those passages of Scripture, fear not, fear not. And I sat there and I listened to his whole sermon. Now, obviously, David Jeremiah is a great preacher and a great man I respect highly. I really do. But I sat there and listened to his whole sermon. I got thinking, well, was I wrong in what I did last Sunday night? And then you can go and look. It's out there wherever you call out there. And then you can watch it for yourself. After listening to those two preachers, I got, I said, maybe I need to back up and double check myself. So I went and pulled out my, my smartphone and I turned it on and I went back to my sermon from last Sunday night and I listened to it. I'm going to be honest with y'all. I still mean it. <laughs> I ain't changed one off. 
I believe with all my heart. And you go to the Word of God and you check it out for yourself. Yes, I know it teaches us that perfect love casts out fear. Yes, it does. Once you're walking in the perfect love of Jesus Christ, once you're walking with Him in such a way as you've got the sin under control and things are like they ought to be, then praise God, fear not. But until that day, listen to me, friend, we got a lot we ought to be scared of. If you notice the scriptures, even here in this one that I just read in Philippians 2, whenever Paul is absent from the Philippians and he's, he's writing back to him, he says, I know you obeyed me while I was there. I know you paid attention to what we had to say. And I know you were good, obedient followers of Jesus Christ and while I was there. But now much more in my absence. And notice what he says here. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling and last Sunday evening as I pointed out even in the case of Elijah when he went up on the mountain and he was facing those 450 false preachers uh, back in 1 Kings chapter 18 and uh, they, they were all there and, and the people were all around and, and I don't know what they were saying all them other folks but I guarantee you that bunch of fake preachers was up there doing just like they do today running their mouths and hollering and screaming and carrying on cutting themselves they were more enthusiastic than ours today even but they were cutting themselves and beg, begging their God whoever their God was to send fire down and consume that offering that they were offering. And you know, they have a God. They just had a, a pile of wood someplace they worshiped or whatever. Maybe it was even made out of gold. I don't know. But it wasn't real. And their God sent no fire. And then Elijah prayed that one little prayer that takes about a verse of scripture. And when he got through praying that prayer, whoo, bang. Down comes fire from glory. Woo, all them people. They all, and you remember the story, 1 Kings chapter 18, and as we pointed out last Sunday night, all the people fell on the ground and cried out, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. They were full of fear of God. Always has been that way. Always will be. You walk in the midst in the presence of God you'll know fear. I'm sorry. I know he loves us. Thank God. Hallelujah. But down here on this earth, friend, you know what you are? You're a sinner. You are. I'm sorry. I don't care what your name is, where you're born, how you're raised. You're a sinner. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's according to God. And our sins should make us fear God. And I got to be honest with y'all. I've been struggling with something. My struggle is how can I help you to really believe? Now, a while back when we went through John's gospel and preached that series of sermons or that book, we pointed out the, the emphasis, the point of the book was to help people believe. All the way through from John chapter 1 to the very end of the book and you get down to the next to the last chapter in John and, it, and there's two verses of Scripture, John 20. Uh, 30 and 31 and it says this is that all these things are written that you might study but but not everything that Jesus did is written but these are so that you might believe believe and I'm thinking to myself how do I help people believe what can I do that would help somebody else believe in Jesus Christ well what can I do I guess the first thing I have to do is just preach the word. Tell you the story of Jesus. We tell the story, we open up the book, and we preach the word so that people can hear it and listen to what is said. That's the first thing we ought to do. Share the story. Uh, share the word. That's, that's number one. How can we help people believe? But I've got to be honest with you. I asked my wife this other day. I said, honey, how you... What's the number one way folks can learn to believe, develop a faith and a belief in something? And then she brought it up. I, the first note I was wanting, and she just, it come out. Seeing is believing. Seeing is believing. I, I thought about that, and I made some notes, and then I realized something. I don't know about you. I've seen some things in my life that when I got through seeing it, and I thought back about what I'd seen, I didn't believe what I saw. You, did y'all catch that? Did that get a little bit confusing? I didn't believe what I saw. I had three times in my life, I'm going to be straight up with you, when I have seen things that I must confess that later on I found out I didn't see what I thought I saw. Y'all ever been there? 
You ever accused anybody of doing something and you find out later they didn't do it? But you just knew they did. You saw them do it. I remember one time when I was a kid in Warner Robins, Georgia, at a little league baseball game. Some friends of mine were playing. I was just an elementary kid. But I remember something I saw. A friend of mine was pitching for one of those two teams. And I was standing over there by the third baseline out in the stands or whatever. And that boy reared back and throwed a pitch. And I said, Listen, my memory is clear. I still see what I saw that night. I saw that boy let that ball go. And it headed toward home plate. And, and on its way to home plate, all of a sudden, it did this. And then it did that. And then it crossed the home plate. And the, preacher, the umpire says, strike. And I, I shook my head and said, I didn't, I didn't see what I think I saw. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. Ain't no way I saw a ball do what I just described. I mean, I just don't believe it can do it. I'm serious. I still remember it in my eye and my brain back there. I can see that ball going. And then all of a sudden it does this. And then all of a sudden it does that. And then it crosses the plate. I don't believe that. But I saw it. And then I figured it out. It's got to be. I don't know. I'm getting to heaven. I'm going to ask God about this, okay? I know God was there. I'm sure he was there. He saw it. I, I may be the only one that saw what I think I saw. But I don't think I really saw what I thought I saw. Y'all caught that? Y'all, have I got y'all confused yet? Listen to me. I had, I mean, I'm serious. I'm trying to be honest here. I had to, while that ball was in the air, and it's headed toward home plate, I had to blink. And when I bl- blinked, that ball went that way and that way. And, and it was down lower about a foot. And it wasn't just going down like a regular pitch. Did you, have, y'all, have y'all ever had a trick like that played on your eyeballs? It's been a couple of years ago. I left the house and I was driving toward town. I was going back over toward the Poor Robin Road area and going the dirt road uh, mostly toward town. And uh, I was driving not far from my house and I looked out across the field and there he was. I saw him. The, the, I remember the cotton was about knee high and all of a sudden out of that knee high cotton he went up and out and into the woods. He was black. He was big. It was a bear. I know it was. I saw him. I said, my stars. That day I went to town, and I, I remember I got around there, and I was talking to Jesse Weaver. Y'all know Jesse knows a lot about the woods. And, uh, and I was talking to I said, Jesse, I'm convinced I saw a bear. He said, where? And I told him exactly where. And he said, you think you saw a bear? I said, I saw him. He'd come up out of that cotton and went and into the blackberry bushes and headed away. I saw him. Jesse went and checked it out. He was willing to go out to where the bear was. I wasn't. <laughs> Jesse went and checked it out. Big old dog track. <laughs> it weren't no bear. It's a big old black dog. I, but I saw it. Y'all, ever, y'all ain't never seen something then later on realized you didn't see what you thought you saw? I'm talking to you plain because I'm talking about trying to help people believe. Oh, my. I know some people ain't going to believe us. It don't matter what we say, right? And I understand that. I understand. Gullible. I, well, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm a gullible person. I, I've told you all that before. I admit it. You come to me to talk to me. If maybe I know you. Maybe I don't. I'm going to want to believe you. I really am. I'm, I'm, I'm the kind of guy that who wants to believe that everybody's going to tell the preacher the truth. Boy, am I a dummy. But I, I, I want to believe. I've got to be honest with you. It's been two, maybe three times in my life that I could tell you about, but I won't where I know somebody was lying to me from the get-go. I mean, it was, it was just unbelievably dumb, the kind of lie they were telling and expecting me to believe it. I'm serious. I sat there and I listened. I never did get mad and blow up in their face and call them a liar or nothing like that. But I knew from the start, this story ain't true. This has not really happened. How do we get folks to believe us when we do tell them? How do we, how do we, how do we say something? I've got to be honest with you all. Listen, please, what I get up here and deal with is eternity. You go into heaven or hell, one, one or the other. And my job, my prayer, my hope, my ambition is to find a way to get you off the road to hell and on the road to heaven. And how can I help you believe me when I tell you that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose from the grave and one day he's coming back again? How can I live or act or do or say? What can I do that would not be a lie in your opinion? Uh, I've tried never to lie up here. I've told you before, I'm very thankful that my father, uh, that was a, a biggie in his life and our life. Lying was not acceptable. It was not. 
and the men he worked with and fished with and all that kind of stuff, they'd tell you, if my daddy told you he caught a two-pound fish, it weighed two pounds or more. If he tell you he caught 50 fish, he caught 50 or more. He didn't, my daddy wasn't lying. And the last time my daddy whooped me was for lying. That's all, he, he told me it wasn't because of what I did, even though I did not do what I was supposed to do. He whipped me because I lied about it and told me so. He said, son, I'm not whipping you because you didn't do it. I'm whipping you because you lied to me. And he told me up. He, I mean, well, you know what? Um, anyway, and uh, well, that's the way we grew up. But uh, lying is something we've got to try to get around. We've got to find a way to tell the truth. And people believe us. So that, oh, wait a minute so that others will believe us, so that you'll believe me when I speak to you and I stand here, then I've got to live a life before you to where I'm willing to let you check me out. And I've got to tell it and live it and be willing to let you examine it and go through that. Preach the Word and preach it in such a way that you know I'm not trying to stretch it. I'm not trying to bend it or twist it. I'm trying as best Daryl Quinn knows how to open up this precious, wonderful, holy book that is a love letter to you from God Almighty about how you can miss the lake of fire and gain the glories of heaven and walk on streets of gold. That's my, my job, I think, number one, first, I know there's a lot of things that people say preachers are supposed to do. I'm going to tell you, number one, help other folks miss hell. Number one, number one. And I, I guess that I might say to you that the first thing is I need to make sure you can believe me. Do your friends know they can trust you? You know, we all, all us Christians are supposed to live in such a way that other folks know when we talk they can trust what we're saying. They can believe us. They can be assured that we're telling the truth. Well, the truth is the Word of God is here. And here when Paul was writing to those Philippians and he told them this, he says, you make sure you work out your own salvation. You, you, do, you work on this thing. This is not just a, a, a little bitty uh, haphazard thing you're going to be doing. You work on it. Oh, we're not saved by works. Don't you leave here and say I said that because I did not. We are not saved by works. We're saved by grace. And uh, it's the grace of God that washes our sins away. It's the shed blood of Calvary's cross where we can have our sins forgiven. Uh, but we should work. We should work because we have been saved. Because God has blessed you with forgiveness and grace and mercy and a home and glory one day. Because God has done that, you and I should work for Jesus. We should work. First of all, live the life. Live it like you're supposed to. I don't have to tell you how to live. You know it already. If I can stand here and walk through a list of things Christians ought to do, A, B, C, D, you know, I, you would sit there and you'd say, yeah, I know that, yeah, I know that, yeah, I know that. I know the Bible teaches that. I know preachers say that. And, and so I don't need to tell you what to do. But listen, I just need to say, do it. Just do it. You already know what you're supposed to be doing. Do it. Live the life. We preach the word and live the life. And I heard a preacher use this little outline years ago, probably over 40 years ago. And I heard him point blank tell us, and the toughest thing to do is not going to be preaching the word. It's not going to be living the life. That's not easy, but it's not the toughest. The toughest is Love the people. Let them know you care about them. Let them know you love them. Love the people. He said, that's going to be the tough one. Because people will stab you in the back. Good people. I'm serious. No doubt in my mind they're saved and going to glory, but they just have a bad day and they stab you in the back. They lie about you. They tell stories on you. They tell other people you ain't this or that when all it is is they just upset and mad on having a bad day. And we're supposed to love them. Oh, Jesus tells us to love our enemies. Yes, he does. Ow. Love them. Well, how do you love them? When you know they're a liar and a backstabber and there's somebody who causes trouble, how do you love them? You take a deep breath and just live the life of a Christian and treat them appropriately. Amen? You love them. You act like you're supposed to act as a Christian to everybody. 
even your enemies. Yes, yes. Well, now, wait a minute. If I do those three simple things, preach the word, live the life, and love the people of the church and community, is that all I need to do? No. There has to be more. Did you read or see what I read while I go in Matthew's gospel? Now, when I, I talk about what you need to do in order to be saved and go to heaven and how I, uh, the number five in my way of witnessing to a lost person, it's, it was in the bulletins when we used to have bulletins. Before a person can go to heaven, there's five things that will happen. This, I, I'm, I'm going to stand here and I'm going to tell you something. This is an absolute. This ain't debatable. This ain't questionable. Everybody that goes to heaven, these five things will happen to them or they don't get there. Now, there's a whole pile of other things we ought to do and should do as Christians, but there's five things you will do or you don't go. You've got to hear about Jesus Christ. There is none other name given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You've got to hear about Jesus. We've all heard. You've got to believe, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You've got to believe, and that's on you, friend. Do you believe it or not? It's up to you. It's up to you. I've met those folks, well, I believe what the red letter says, but I don't believe all them others, Paul and James and Peter and all, I don't believe them. That's your problem. That's your tough day. You've got to hear about Jesus Christ. You've got to believe. You've got to Repent. I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And Jesus said that twice in John, uh, Luke chapter 13, verse 3 and verse 5. I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. You've got to repent. You've got to hear, you've got to believe, you've got to repent. And you've got to confess. Confess. I ain't telling you you've got to get in the pulpit. But if you're not willing to admit to other folks around you that Jesus Christ is Lord, I don't believe you're saved. That's just plain and simple, straightforward. If you're not willing to, to admit that Jesus Christ is the Lord and He's the Savior, if you're not willing to de declare that, you got a problem. That's confessing. But there is a fifth one. I tell you, this is the fifth one. Jesus said in John chapter 6, verse 44. Except my Father draw you, no man can come. You cannot get saved just because you decided today's the day. You cannot get saved just because you want to get saved. There are numerous passages of Scripture which teach there are going to be folks who believe, who do a lot, Jesus said it, Matthew 7, 21 through 23. There are going to be people coming to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we preach in your name? Lord, Lord, didn't we uh, cast out demons in your name? Lord, Lord, didn't we do many wonderful works in your name? And what did Jesus say? I never knew you. I'm sorry. Well, that's what Jesus said in his own words. So there's going to be folks who are going to do things but they're not going to be saved. And that's the reason I read these other verses of Scripture where it said many are called, but few are chosen. And Jesus stressed that. He stressed that. There's going to be many folks who were, who were called. Come. Well, as a matter of fact, the call is for everybody. Whosoever will may come if you're willing. Many are called, but few follow through. You see, Jesus knows, it, it, it's, and this is where the, the, some of the doctrines get confusing. Some folks will say, well, I know Jesus has already decided. He predestinates who will be saved and who will not be saved. And he, he calls who he wants to save, and he doesn't call those he doesn't want to be saved, that kind of thing. They, they, I'm going to be honest with you. See, Jesus already knows who will and who won't. Whenever he issues out the call, come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, come unto me. When he issues that call, he knows who's going to be willing to come. He knows everything. He knows everything. He knows what you ate for supper last night. He knows what you said this morning when you got up and realized it was Sunday. Y'all remember the Walt Disney movie back when they were good? And uh, 
little Haley Mills, and uh, she was a missionary's daughter. Her mom and dad died overseas, and she had to come back to the States and live with her aunt. And they all went to church religiously. But they all dreaded Sunday morning. Brother Paul, did you remember dread Sunday morning? In this movie, they dreaded Sunday morning. And they even told her, and she was a missionary. She said, oh, no, it's the Lord's Day, it's Sunday. We get to go to church. She's, oh. And then finally, she had been there long enough, she went to church with him one Sunday. And the preacher got up there and, today you're going to hell. And he, hey, he was rough. He was bad news. And when they got through uh, that afternoon, they was having their Sunday lunch, and one of the maids of the house who had already told that little girl Sunday wasn't a good day, Sunday's not a good day, we don't like going to church. And uh, the little girl uh, is there, uh, and, and the maid says, Now, what do you think's good about Sunday? And she goes, Oh, you know, Sunday's pretty bad. That's, pretty, mm, that's not good. But she did finally figure out something that was good about Sunday. Does anybody remember what she said was good about Sunday? I guarantee you, some of you know it. Some of you know it. You know what she said was good about Sunday? She finally come back to that maid and the maid, other maids that were there, and she said, i tell you what's good about Sunday. They said, something good about Sunday? Yeah, it's six days before we have another one. <laughs> My job, I believe with all this, this heart right here, is to try to find a way to help all of you Believe in Jesus Christ of Calvary's cross. That's my job. First of all, then I reckon I need to live a life in front of you so you'll trust me when I get up here to preach. I'm serious. Oh, but you need to live a life in front of your friends and family so that when you talk to them, they'll trust you. I'm sure you've had folks, known folks like I have too. I've known some folks that if they opened their mouth, you could just about bet it was a lie. I mean, I've known some of them people. I'm serious. They just always wanted to stretch the story, exaggerate or whatever. You know, well, love them anyway. But listen to me. That's not acceptable for you. You're a Christian. You're a believer in the Christ of Calvary's cross. Tell the truth. I remember an old Bob Hope movie. I know there was one put out a few years ago. I, I, I can't remember his name. I don't keep up with all the actors. Bob Hope put out 50 years ago a movie about him where he had to tell the truth for 24 hours or something like that. No little slip up. Anybody? Oh, to tell, it was like about telling the truth. And, and he had to tell the truth. And these folks, were, it was a big bet on it. As if you do it right and you don't tell any lies for 24 hours, you get a pile of money. If you don't, we know it's going to cost you. And, and for 24 hours, they'd be talking about a lady that was sitting across the table from him and, and how her hair looked. And they would say, oh, don't she look good? Well, they knew that they were all lying, but Bob Hope couldn't lie. And he looked at her, and I don't remember what he said, but he wiggled around it and said something else instead of lying about what her hair looked like. I mean, wait a minute. The whole thing was based on that. If we had to do that, and you and I had to find a way to get through all the time without telling any lies, any little crazy, shady stories, and we're going to tell the truth, then everybody else will believe you. They'll believe you if you, they find you to be truthful. I'm trying, okay, I'm trying. I'm trying to tell you there is a heaven to gain. There's streets of gold to walk on. There's gates of pearls to walk through. There's walls of jasper to gaze up at. And oh, you talk about a reunion that's coming. Our loved ones that have gone on before us as Christians we're going to see them. We're going to hug them. And I believe we're going to be just like 1 John 5, 3 says that, uh, uh, 1 John 3, 2, excuse me, where it says that uh, one day we will see him and we will be like him. And we already know what he is like. In the resurrection story of Luke 24, it says that he was visible. They saw him. It says he was hearable. They, he talked to them. It says he was touchable. He says, reach hither, touch me, as a ghost has flesh and bone. And he was feedable. He took some of the honeycomb and fish and ate it right there. My stars, how real you want to get. Visible, touchable, hearable, and feedable. That's good enough for Daryl Quinn. I hope it's good enough for you. And we'll get to glory and we'll enjoy all that. But listen, between here and there, we're supposed to be trying to find a way to talk other people into going there too.
So let's live the life. Let's tell the truth. Not shun from the responsibilities. The truth sometimes is bad. It's hard. A lake of fire. And as uh, Reverend Booth, who started the Salvation Army over in England, uh, whenever the, he was confronted by the other church leaders in England and London, uh, they come to him and say, how is it you can get your, your members to go out here and stand on the street corners in the dead of winter when it's snowing and they blow them trumpets and, and pick them guitars and, and they sing uh, uh, the gospel and somebody will start preaching and it's snowing and it's cold out there. How do you get them to do that? We can't even get them to come to church and sit on a pew. He said, my first sermon I preached to all of our new members as I do my very best to take them and picture for them hanging over the gates of hell and looking down in and hearing the cries of those who die without Jesus and wind up in eternal pain in a lake of fire. That I try my best to make every person who joins the Salvation Army see vividly and hear with their ears that which happens to folks who don't know Christ. And when we get a good picture of where them folks are going and what's fixing to happen to them, you're more likely to be willing to get up and go look at them and tell them, Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the way. If you realize where they're going. Yeah. what I want to do I want you to believe me Jesus died for you I want you to know I mean that and he tells us that if we'll accept him as our Savior and ask him to forgive us for our sins he'll forgive us and he'll save us oh, and he'll change us Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have been made new. And I'm excited to tell you, I know that happened to Daryl Quinn. Oh, if you can just believe it. And that first person that I ever had the privilege to lead to Christ, a friend of mine I'd gone through school with, gone to church with, and she was the queen of the GAs, had got all that stuff that the GA girls would get. Memorized everything she was supposed to memorize and was queen at Second Baptist Church. But after I got saved, about two months later, she calls me and she says, Daryl, I got to talk to you. We've been friends for years. She's 21 now. She's probably 22. She said, Daryl, I want to talk to you. I said, okay. I went to see her. She said, Daryl, what's happened? I said, what do you mean? I said, you ain't the same. I said, well, I know I'm not the same. She said, but, but we grew up together. I said, I know it. She said, what's different about you? And I looked at her and I said, I asked Jesus Christ to forgive me and save me. And he did. And I, and I pointed, I had a gospel track in my hand. And I pointed to it and I said, I did what this track says do. She said, Daryl, I memorized those verses years ago, and you know I did. When I, was in, when I was in the GAs and I was a queen and going through all those steps, I had to memorize it. I said, I didn't memorize it. I did it. Are you hearing me? It's not a case of you knowing what to do. It's not a case of you knowing what John 3, 16 says. It's not a case of you saying, well, I know what the Bible says. It's a case of, have you done it? Have you done it? you got to pray and ask Jesus Christ to forgive you for your sin. I can't do it for you. I wish I could. My mama couldn't do it for me, and I can't do it for you. But you've got to do it. For with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. You've got to be willing to confess to Christ that you're a sinner. I still remember well when I was eight years old and I went down there at that revival and, and got down to the front and that little lady led all of about five kids in prayer and asking Christ to forgive us for our sins. And I, I still remember sitting in the end zone at the Rumble High School football field and me sitting there and all I could do as an as a eight-year-old boy, I was looking at the grass thinking, this is the end zone of the football field. I'm, I'm serious. I'm serious. And, and, and she led in a prayer, and my sister was sitting right next to me, and then a couple of other kids, and, and I remember why she would lead them in a prayer to ask Christ to be their Savior. I, I didn't pray. I just looked over at them. I looked at my sister. Looked them. I saw what they were doing. But I didn't do it. 
Angela, do you remember at the, what's the little town down there? Were y'all members of George, St. George? I preached a revival down there one time. John was the pastor. I'll never forget revival service. I preach my little sermon, sermon ed. I get through, and I turned it over to the pastor, and I go sit down in the front row. John's son, oldest son, came and sat right next to me. Sat there for just a minute next to me, and some people started coming. I can't believe it, but they did. And one man comes down and gets on his knees at the altar, and I'll never forget this little guy sitting right next to me. Look, look at him. He was up and gone. And he went down there by that man. Got on his knees right next to that man. That man had his hands on the altar and his knees on the floor. And he was over like this. And that little fella got down right next to him and bent over and got under him and looked up at him to see what he was doing. <laughs> Yeah, that's some of your, your folk, Angela, that you grew up around. I think you babysat that little boy. You probably taught him to do that. Mm -hmm. No, wait a minute. I'm sorry, but I've got to tell you, if you don't pray and ask Jesus Christ to be your Savior, you're headed for a lake of fire, and you might go today. Do you understand? And by the way, Christian brothers and sisters in the room, whom I believe most of you are saved, I do. Your job, your job is to tell the world. Ye shall be my witnesses. It's not arguable, it's not debatable. You know Christ as your Savior? Then you've been left here for a reason. Are you telling the folks you know and love, your neighbors, your friends? I wish I knew how to snap my fingers and all of a sudden you would all believe me. You have only one choice. You either get saved or to be over. You won't see your loved ones that are saved. It'll be over. No good news. No good fellowship. It'll be over. It's a lake of fire that Jesus described. Your choice. Heads bowed, eyes closed. I know from the study of the precious book that all of us have got to make this decision for ourselves. Your mama, your daddy, your wife, your husband, your children, they can't do it for you. It's your call. It's your decision. Jesus did his part. Will you do yours? Lord, in this room, I know, God, that that you love every one of us. You've already provided a place for all of us. On, Lord, on glory, hallelujah, on the streets of gold, Lord. But also know, Lord, we haven't all settled that issue. May we make up our mind. May we be convinced you're real. Heaven is real. And may we prepare to go there. For it's in Jesus' sweet name I pray. 317. 317, friend. What do you need to do? Let's do it. Let's do it today. Come, every soul by sin, oppress there's mercy with the Lord, and He will surely give your rest by trusting. Your call, friend. Your call. Jesus loves you. He's already done everything that needs to be done for you to get there. Your call.
trust him only trust him now he will save you he will save you he will save you now heads bowed eyes closed while she plays another verse your chance to do what you know God wants you to do I challenge you say yes Lord yes He's calling, don't you say no.